All right, welcome back. In this video, we are looking at example number three for drawing shear force diagrams and bending moment diagrams. In this case, we have a simply supported beam with a distributed load that goes right across the top and uh, two point loads pressing up from the bottom of the beam. So what we need to do is, first of all, we need to determine what our reactions here are at A and B. Now, you can do this by solving the sum of moments about A and then doing the force balance in the Y direction. Or you could skip that work and notice that this problem is symmetrical about the center of the beam. And so we could just take uh, the sum of all the forces pressing down minus the sum of the forces pressing up and then just distribute that into each beam. So basically we'd get uh, 10 kilonewtons per meter times 12. That'd be 120 kilonewtons pressing down. We have 40 pressing up, so that leaves 80 that we need to have pressing up. And because of the symmetry, that would be 40 into each of these reactions. Um, all right, so knowing that, now, now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and set up the shear force and bending moment diagrams. And now we can start drawing the shear force diagram uh, from the left-hand side, working our way across. So let's start off with our free body diagram with a virtual cut just to the left, or sorry, just to the right of point A here. Um, so we're going to have that reaction is 40 kilonewtons pressing up, and we'll have some internal shear force uh, pressing down. So that's going to have to be 40, because this, uh, as long as we're just to the right here, an infinitesimally small distance, then the distributed load will also be infinitesimally small, so it won't be showing up on the free body diagram. Uh, it's pressing down, like I said, so uh, that's going to be uh, on the right of a cut, so that will be positive 40. All right, so we're going to start out right about, let's call that positive 40. Okay, so now let's do uh, our free body diagram that's extended just to the left of this point load. So we're going to have to basically come on and include this distributed load, uh, four meters worth of that. So that's going to be four times 10, that'll be 40 pressing down. And uh, then our shear force here, just to the left of this point load, is going to be, well, it'll be 40 up, 40 down, so this will actually be equal to zero. So, boom, right there. Uh, the one other thing that we like to do in these is to draw on our marker lines. Um, probably should have done that right away, but uh, this is just going to help us uh, line up these points of interest as we go along uh, and keep our bending moment diagram and shear force diagram basically in line with each other. So we can go and throw that last one on there, too. Okay. So uh, let's just fill in. This is going to be a straight line in that first section, just like that. Maybe let's draw this um, a little bit thicker of a line. Here we go. Boom, down like that. All right, and we can label this as zero. Okay, so if we go and draw on our, sh or if we extend our free body diagram here, so it's just to the right of this point load, then we're going to be in adding on this extra 20 kilonewtons. And uh, so we'll have 40 going up, 40 going down, those two will net out to zero. So basically we'll have 20 going up and we'll need to have the shear force of, uh, of 20 going down basically to get that static equilibrium. So it's going to come up halfway uh, and this value will be like that, just like that. So it'll be positive 20 and we can label that. Boom. All right. Now if we extend our free body diagram so that it goes all the way just to the left of this point load, we're going to be adding on another 40. Uh, kilonewtons of distributed load here. So what I would do is I would just basically cross that out and uh, now this is going to be 80. Um, so again you can do this, uh, you can do the force balance here. We have 60 up, uh, 80 down, so this is going to have to need, this is going to need to be uh, basically the shear of 20 pointing up. Or another way that sometimes I like to do this um, is I know that this is just going to be pushing us 4 times 10 40 kilonewtons linearly towards the negative direction. So that's basically going to extend down to minus 20 here. Or you can also see that here by yeah, 60 up, 80 down. So we need to have 20 up and that's going to be opposite the positive sign convention, making that a negative value. All right, so we'll just connect those lines just like that. And then if we go and draw on our extender free body diagram, just so it's just to the right of this point load, then we're going to have basically another 20 pressing up. And that's going to bring us uh, of a total right back to this zero point. So it's gonna shoot us up to zero because 40 up, 20 up, 20 up, that's 80 going up, 80 going down. That internal shear force at this point is going to be equal to zero. And then lastly, if we just extend our free body diagram all the way just to the left of point B here, uh, then we're going to basically be updating this distributed load to be 120 instead. And then 120 minus 80, uh, we're basically going to be needing 
this internal shear force to be 40 kilonewtons pressing up to get that force balance, and that will bring us down to a value of negative 40, somewhere down there. All right, so that's going to be negative 40. Now, again, like we've been looking at in previous videos, um, the slope of this section is going to be the same as the slope in this section is the same as the slope in this section um, because it's all just that one single uh, constant distributed load. It's the same load. We're just getting those jumps in it where we're having point loads being applied. And uh, like in the last videos, our point loads were pressing down and it was jumping it downwards. In this case, we're, uh, we're getting those point loads pressing up and it's jumping it upwards, but we confirm that with the free body diagram. The last thing that we do want to check here is that uh, that we are ending at an appropriate amount of shear that we're expecting. So if we were to draw the free body diagram uh, at point B here, sectioning just to the left of point B, then we would have, um, if it's infinitesimally close or very tiny distance, then the, uh, then the distributed load won't contribute anything. So we'll basically just get that reaction force, 40 kilonewtons pressing up. The internal shear force will have to be 40 kilonewtons pressing down to the left of our virtual cut, and that is opposite the sign convention here. So that means that it would, uh, the magnitude would be 40, the sign would be negative, and that's exactly what we're getting here. So uh, we know that we've done that correctly. All right, so now when we come onto our bending moment diagram here, um, Again, if you remember, we were wanting to take the, the area, if it's on the positive side of the shear force diagram, then that's going to be a change in magnitude towards the positive direction. On these two, these will be areas on the negative side, and that's going to result in a change in magnitude towards the negative side. So here, the area of this section in here is a uh, one half base times height. So the base there is four meters, and the height is 40 kilonewtons. So we get a change in magnitude of, uh, that is 80 kilonewton meters. And so that's going to bring us up to, let's say, right about there. And because this is a sloped line in the shear force diagram, that means we are getting a parabolic curvature like that uh, on the bending moment diagram. Now in this case, this is kind of an interesting point here. Let's just draw on a marker um, right here where the shear force diagram crosses the, uh, let's change that to black actually. Where the shear force diagram uh, crosses the uh, the axis here, we're going to be getting a local maximum and minimum because obviously we're going to be tending towards positive on this side with our change in magnitude, and on this side we're going to be tending towards negative. So that will be a change in uh, or basically a maximum or minimum there. So when we uh, calculate this area here, one half base height. Uh, let's switch back to a nice thick color there. So we have. One half times well by symmetry again. This is we're going from twenty positive twenty to negative twenty. So uh, across a distance of four meters. And if this was if one of these numbers was bigger than each other, then this would be centered somewhere else. But we can really quickly pick off that this is going to be crossing the axis uh, two meters away from this side and two meters away from that side. So uh, the base of this triangle is two meters and the height was uh, twenty kilonewtons. So basically that's one half times uh, two that cancels out and we just get a change in magnitude of 20 kilonewton meters. Um, so that's going to be a change in magnitude. So that's going to bring us up to here. Um, we probably should have labeled this on, that was 80. And then we get another parabolic curvature coming up to a value of 20 uh, units higher. So that will be at 100 kilonewton meters. Now, this problem is symmetrical, so right away I actually know that the left-hand side of this bending moment diagram is going to just be the mirror image of the right-hand side, but we can go ahead and just calculate it anyways. The area of this triangle here is, again, it's one-half times the base, which was 2 meters, times the height, which is 20, or negative 20, if you will. So that's going to bring us towards, because this area is on the negative side of the shear force diagram, it's going to bring us towards the negative axis for that change in magnitude, so it'll bring us back down to 80 and this will be parabolic like that. <laughs> Not very good at drawing parabolas, but whatever. Um, so that's 80, and then uh, in this area, we have 1 half times that 4 meters times the height, which is uh, negative 40 there. And again, that will be a change in magnitude in 80 kilonewton meters, and that's going to bring us down right down to zero. And in this case, we have a simply supported beam, so we should be expecting that the ends of that beam are in fact zero kilonewton meters because this is not a fixed rigid connection. Um, this is just uh, the end of the beam here on a pin, so that's not going to be building up any significant uh, or any type of internal bending moment. 
So there we go. We got the shear force diagram and we got the bending moment diagram. We have noticed here that where this uh, where this crosses zero, um, that we're getting a local maximum or minimum. That's an important thing to be able to pick off. Um, and then if your professor asked you to draw the deflected shape of, uh, of the beams that you're looking at, basically this one, again, nothing really interesting is happening here. It's just sagging down. Um, you'll see... Uh, You'll see in uh, in the couple videos from now when we start looking at overhanging beams, we're going to be getting the bending moment diagram basically crossing the axis, and then in those cases it'll be a little bit more interesting to us. We'll be able to find inflection points and that sort of thing. But again, it's just good practice to be able to figure out that yeah, if we're putting a bunch of weight pressing down on the top and just a little bit pressing up, then we understand that this is going to be sagging down. And also the other comparison that we can make is the deflected shape. If you're drawing your bending moment diagrams like I do with them uh, basically on the top of the axis here for positive bending moments, uh, then you can loosely as kind of uh, as, uh, make the connection that the deflected shape will basically sort of resemble the inverse of this. If you live in a country where you draw the bending moment diagram uh, positive bending moments below the axis, then again it will basically just sort of follow that profile for the general shape of the deflected structure. All right, guys, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.